I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So growing up, how many of us had parents who made this statement to us? You ready? Don't play with your food. Any, anybody? My daughter's holding her hand up like, yes. You've said that, Dad. Don't play with your food. Hold on to that. Don't throw that back. But you know, there's something amazing about being able to take something, i.e. a marshmallow, and play with it. You know, when I was a kid, we used to do these uh, stick figures where we would get toothpicks and we would make little marshmallow men. You, you guys ever do this before? Or am I alone in this? You would get all these different marshmallow pieces and you would put it together and you would craft a person and then if you were really super artsy you'd have these wiggly eyes that never stayed still so it always looked like he was looking in two different directions and as you put all these pieces together to make your Olaf looking snowman you guys seen Frozen? you're tracking with me? all right just making sure it's one of the biggest movies ever let it go let it go no but as you put it together there's something about us being creative. You see, when God made you, he placed within you the ability, the capacity to be creative because God is creator. God as creator has made us in his Imago Dei, the image and likeness of God. And part of what it means to be God, that God is creator, we are, say it with me, creative. We are, we are creative. And it is okay to express that creativity. He doesn't have to be perfect. He doesn't have to look normal. He can be kind of an alien. But as you and I have creative capacity, we live out who God has created us to be when we are creative. You know, it's interesting. Somebody had asked me the other day, Pastor, why are these boxes here? Why, why are these little boxes here? Why are there lights in them? Well, we want to be creative. But they're actually multifaceted. They're here because if you're watching online, hello, church family who's watching us online, this is actually right at the level of about my head, so it looks like this is the background. So that when you watch online, all of the noise that is back there, not that it's noise, but visual noise online, is reduced to just the image of a light and the cross. We moved the altar out of the way because during this season, and we've talked about this, we are in the season of when to say time during the church year where we prepare our hearts and our minds for the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ but during the season of lent they actually say to remove shiny objects from the sanctuary so we went with subtle lights wood that draws our mind to the cross the simplicity birthed out of creativity because our god is creator and we have the capacity to create. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 8, it says these words. It says, But now, Lord, you are our Father. 
We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. You see, God has uniquely fashioned you together. It was a little bit more complex than sticking toothpicks into a marshmallow. But imagine being the clay of the ground. In the Hebrew, the word for clay is Adam, where we get the name Adam. The Adam, the clay that God takes in the Old Testament, that He fashions together intricately, meticulously, creatively, putting a leg here and a leg there and a foot here and a foot there and five eyes here and he looked at it and he went, no, they only need two. An arm here, a hand there. And he fashions humanity together. And then God does something that only God can do. He breathes the breath of life into that first Adam. And he comes to life. God has uniquely created each and every one of us from the clay. You are the clay. He is the potter. You have been uniquely created by God. And we're going to continue our series this morning as we look at the Apostles' Creed by looking at that one particular verse. It says that I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker, of heaven and earth. Well, last week we spent some time unpacking the word credo or credimus. We said that credo, the Latin word, is the first word of the creed where we get the word I believe. Because remember, the creed is both personal and corporate. The word credimus is the first word used in the Nicene Creed, which states we believe. So I believe and we believe, because we are in this together, amen? Amen. Faith is not meant to be gone at alone. We are a Wesleyan community, i.e. we follow the teachings of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. John Wesley was famous for saying, I know nothing of solitary religion, as in you can't go at it alone. You were created for community. You were created for family. You were created for fellowship. We are in this together, and we are at our best when we are united with one another. Amen? So we looked at this idea of faith, credo, that we all have faith. Back in the day, there was a a reformer by the name of John Calvin. Anybody ever heard of John Calvin? He's a contemporary of Martin Luther and these early reformers. And Calvin was famous for saying that the human heart is an idol-making factory. You were created to worship, and given the opportunity, you will worship anything. But your worship and your faith is only as strong as the object in which it is placed. Is your faith firmly rooted in God, or is your faith flimsily rooted in something else? Where is your faith? Does it rest upon the hope of the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, or does it rest upon Maybe a marshmallow. How strong of faith would this be? <laughs> Don't play with my food. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> well, we want to continue by looking at the object of our faith. So let's pray, and then let's dive into that first statement of the Apostles' Creed. Lord, This morning, it is my prayer that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive the beauty and the majesty of just how good you are. Help us to understand what it means when we say the name God. Help us to understand what it means when we say that you are Father, that you are Almighty, that you are Creator. Again, Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what does it mean when we say the word God? 
I know for many of us, if I was to tell you right now, go ahead and think of an image or, or, or a thought or some sort of uh, idea of what you understand God to be. And for some of us, we're going to have one idea. And for others of us, we're going to have another idea. And yet for others of us, we might have yet again another idea. But what do we mean as Christians when we say the word God? Well, the reality is that our language, our minds, they cannot accurately articulate and answer this question. We must be aware that neither the biblical nor the creedal language that we are using about God can fully um, articulate the matter of which we speak. Some time back, I, I had kind of shared the idea that our mind is like a coffee cup, right? And God is the equivalent of the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of difficult to fit all of God into the finiteness of our mind, but yet we keep trying. Our language is inadequate. It's not fully developed enough for us to be able to fully explain what we mean when we say the word God. But we're going to do our best to try to unpack a little bit of this this morning. Now, the statement that we are all agreeing on when we speak of God is the statement that God exists. And we commit this as a fundamental posture towards everything else that exists because it is God who is the creator of all things. We understand that when God created, God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. God took nothing and made something. Have any of us ever been able to take nothing and make something? We've been able, in our creative capacity, to take something and turn it into something else. We have to take the substance that God has already created and fashion it together into something else. It is only God alone who creates out of nothing. Everything in this world is dependent upon God. While different religious traditions have quite a different understanding of God, all religious people share something that non-believers do not. And it's the conviction that when we say God, we are speaking of something, someone that truly exists. The question of God's existence affects our perception of absolutely everything else that exists and the way that we deal with and interact with all of existence. Scripture, though, warns against uh, those who deny the existence of God. In Psalm 14, verses 1-4, through it says this. It says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man and sees if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have all become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Paul continues this in the New Testament book of Romans by saying, that because they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and have worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. There is this great exchange that the Apostle Paul writes about in Romans that for many in society at his time, just as for many in society today, they have exchanged the truth for a lie. The truth being that there is a God, that He is personal, he is knowable, that he is intimate, that he is creator. They've exchanged the truth of God for the lies that God is unknowable, that God is distant, that God does not exist. They've bought into the lies of gentlemen like Frederick Nietzsche or Christopher Hitchinson, these great atheist men, great in their capacity to use language to try to move people away, but far from understanding the truth and the reality of who God is. They have bought into the lie. The Scriptures show us that to willfully deny God's existence distorts our own perception of the world and distorts the way that we live. Have you ever thought about how your life would be if you didn't know God? I know that in my own life, I would not be the same person. 
It's because of knowing God that I met my wife. It's because of knowing God that we had a family. It's because of knowing God that I've been in the vocation that I am. My wife was asking me the other day, she said, Chris, if, if you could do anything else besides being a pastor, like, what would you do? And it was hard for me because I couldn't see myself doing anything else but this, but I guess the closest thing would be a teacher. I love the educational aspect of being able to communicate and talk and, and help people unpack things and have that light bulb moment, that moment where we'll say something and all of a sudden I see the twinkle in your eyes, like all of a sudden that light bulb went off and you're like, oh, I, I get that. That is a God-given gift that, that I truly am blessed to be able to bring forth to the congregation. But I've thought at times what my life would look like if I did not know Jesus. I would still be heading down a path towards selfishness, towards indulgence, towards the things of this world that draw me further from others, further from love, further from grace. When we are not focused on God, we have a distorted perspective. So when we say God, and we say God exists, and we say that God is real, what do, what do we mean by it? Well, a couple things. First, we believe that God is Lord. When we pray, sometimes we pray to the Lord our God. That word Lord comes from the, um, man, I can't remember if it's Greek or Hebrew at this point. I've studied both of them. But it comes from the word Adonai. It's the idea of somebody who is over somebody else. And this is not a master of sorts, but this is a person in a position of authority. When we say that God is Lord, we're saying that God is sovereign that there is no one above God, that God is in control of all things. There is nothing that is outside of the control of God. Even though for us at times we feel as though life is chaotic and out of control, that for us we cannot in our own capacity control things, but praise be to God that He is sovereign and in control. Have you ever heard this lie? I'm going to say this and some of you are going to push back, and that's okay. But have you ever heard the lie that God will never give you more than you can handle? Yeah, He will. Absolutely. Here's the caveat. God will never give you more than He can handle through you. That is God and His sovereignty. That is God working all things out for the good of those who are loved and called according to His purposes. God is sovereign and in control. We also mean that God is personal. He has a name and can be known. God reveals Himself to Moses in the Old Testament during this beautiful interaction with a burning bush. I always wondered, and I took this in seminary, I took Exodus, it was one of my favorite classes, and the professor asked the question of, was the bush always burning and Moses never noticed? Or did the bush catch on fire that day? I think the bush was always burning but that's a different sermon for a different day. But when Moses goes to the bush, God tells him to do something. Take off your sandals, for this ground is consecrated and holy. And Moses says, who are you? And God reveals, I am who I am. I was who I was. I is who I is. I will be who I will be. I am. It's a four-letter Tetragram with no vowels. It's Yahweh. We pronounce that as Yahweh. That happens when you take the, uh, the letters for Adonai and you place it over those four words, and that's how you pronounce that word as Yahweh. But God is personal. He has a name, and He has revealed Himself, and He can be known by us. God is also compassionate. God cares for the hurting. God sees you in the midst of your pain and He knows your suffering and your sorrow. He sees you through every trial and tribulation. He's with you through every change and conflict. God is compassionate. God is also patient. Scripture teaches that He is slow to anger. Any of us good at patience? the fruit of God's Spirit, the more that we 
trust him, we live for him, the more that we dedicate our lives to him, the more that patience should well up within us. But praise be to God that we're all in the process of being sanctified. We're not fully arrived. I always joke that if you want to learn patience and you pray to God for patience, you're going to get into a car, uh, uh, not, what's the word I'm looking for? Like traffic jam. Every time I pray for patience, I sit in a traffic jam. It just happens. God is helpful. He's at work in creation. God has not stopped. God did not check out, go to Starbucks, order a latte, sit down, and wait for things to happen. God is still active in creation. Have you ever studied astronomy? Like the study of the stars, not astrology, and the, not, like actual astronomy. They're saying that there are still worlds that are being created even today. That when God spoke all things into creation, it was such a powerful blast. It was the Big Bang. God spoke and bang, it happened. But it's still expanding and going out and worlds are still being created. God is still present and active in the midst of creation just as much as he's present and active in the midst of your life. God is loving. He is affectionate towards you. God is faithful. He never gives up on you. And God is holy. He's filled with truth and set apart. This is the the foundation for what we mean when we say God. But let's go a step further. We said that we believe in God the Father Almighty, when we say that we believe in God, we also say that we believe that God is one. Christians believe there is only one God. We don't mean that our God is the top God above all these other little gods. We're saying that there is no other God besides God. Now, we live at times like there's other gods, We set up for ourselves little G idols, things that we bow down to and worship at times, things like money, convenience, technology, comfort, cars, children, spouses, the list can go on and on. Again, I come back to Calvin who said our hearts is an idol-making factory. Given the opportunity, we will worship anything. We're not saying that God is one God amongst many gods. We are not polytheistic. We are not pantheistic or panentheistic. We are monotheistic and Trinitarian in our belief that God is one. We're saying that there is only one true God of all of the universe, and in saying that, we're saying that God is the God, the only God, but also personal and my God. Not just the pastor. He is our God, each and every one of us. Remember in the Apostles' Creed, we said last week that it grew out of the ancient confession found in Deuteronomy 6.4. Let's go back and look at that passage again. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. Israel's profession of the Lord as one God stood out amongst the surrounding people groups who were all polytheistic. They had a God for rain. They had a God for harvest. They had a God for fertility. They had a God for this. They had a God for that. When the Apostle Paul stepped in in the book of Corinthians and he goes to Mars Hill, they said that they even had uh, an altar to an unknown God. They wanted to make sure all of their bases were covered. And Paul shows up and he goes, that God of the unknown gods, that's the only real God and His name is Yahweh. Let me tell you about Him. Let me tell you about His Son, Jesus. In Isaiah 44, 6, it says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. So when we say that we believe in God, we're saying that we believe that He is one. But we are also saying that we believe that He is Father. Yahweh's fatherhood is revealed above all in his creating of a people and nurturing them. In Psalm 68, 5, God says that he is the father of the fatherless, the protector of widows. He is God who dwells within his holy habitation. 
In this case, God defends the weak and the helpless as a form of adoption. The Lord can rescue in a way that human fathers cannot. For Christians, we know God as Father because Jesus calls Him Father, reveals Himself as God's Son, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit enables us to share in that familial relationship through Christian adoption. God is the Father of all. And God is the source of all that has ever been seen or unseen. Now it's important to notice the order and the line within the creed. The fatherhood of God precedes his might. Some of us, we tend to get into this argument at times that God is almighty. No, 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 God is all good. Before God is all good and before God is almighty, God is all personal. He's relational. He wants us to see him through the lens of his fatherhood. Now, for some of us, and I've actually, I've had a lot of debate with others about this, even as of late. Some of us, we struggle with the word father when referring to God because sometimes we compare it to the earthly relationship that we have with our biological fathers. And we think, you know, if God is Father and we compare Him to our earthly father, then sometimes that earthly father doesn't measure up and we think, okay, if that's what God is like, then God won't measure up either. But that is a fallacy. I know for some of us, we do come in here today and we carry the baggage of having a damaged relationship with loved ones maybe even our Father, and we think, I can't refer to God as Father because I've been hurt by mine. Hear me. Where our earthly fathers fall short, God has never fallen short. He is always faithful. He is always just. He is always good. He is always loving and caring and protecting and seeing you through. So where your earthly father might fall short, your heavenly Father never has, never is, and never will. We should not be hung up on this. We should understand that it should draw us close. So in the in the term father, when we use the term father to describe God, it indicates that even from the start, he's calling us to personal relationship. Where there's a father, there must be a child, and where there are children, there must be a family. You ever wonder why we constantly call this our church family? Because if God is our Father and we are His children, thus we form a family. God's fatherhood is not merely a human fatherhood, as we said. He is the original Father from whom all fathering is derived. When we approach God as Father, we can do so with confidence, thinking of Him as Abba, Daddy. I never understood what this looked like until I became a father myself. And I think I shared the story, but like that, that first time my daughter started crawling, she's crawling around the house, my oldest Ella, and she's crawling around and she's pulling herself up. And one time after an up all night lock in with the youth group, I put some pillows out and I'm like, she won't roll over the pillows. Next thing I knew, she's in the living room. Like, just, I don't know how that happened. But she's rolling around and she's crawling up. And I remember one time I'm on the couch and she pulls on my pant leg and she looks up at me and she wasn't really talking you know just kind of baby babbling and she looks up at me and she puts her hands up and as dad I'm sitting there looking down going not today kid no just kidding (laughs) but I scoop her up and I, I put her on my knee and she just buries her head in my chest and just babbles. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I remember just in that moment, God saying to me, it's like, this is what it's like. This is what it's like when my children come to me and pray. It's what it's like when my children come to me in joy. This is, this is what it's like when I say that I'm God the Father. You see, no matter where we are in our life, each and every one of us and come tug on the pant leg of God, and God's going to look down and scoop us up and place us in his lap, and we can bury our head into God's chest, and we can just blah, 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 blah. He sees us. 
Do you ever think about that? God sees us every moment of every minute of every day. He knows the joys of your life. He knows the hopes of your life. He knows the things that stir your affection. He knows it all, but yet He sits there and He waits for us to come to Him, to tug on His leg, to sit in His lap, and to confess to Him the joys, the struggles, the sorrows. God wants to hear from you. He is your Father who is compassionate and kind towards you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. Listen, God is not an impersonal force or an abstract idea. He is Father. When we claim God as Father, we claim that we're a part of His larger family. When we claim God that is, is, is Father, we claim that He is Provider. When we claim that God is Father, we believe, as James 1.17 says, that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from our Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This is what it means when we say that God is Father. Lastly, when we say that we believe in God, the Father Almighty, we believe that God is, in fact, almighty. As, I, as we go to land this plan, I'm going to invite our, our band to come back up. And as they get in place, I'm just going to go through just a little bit left. When we say that God is almighty, we say that God can do anything, for he is omnipotent. God can do whatever he wants unless God has self-limited himself because of his own character. Is there anything that God can't do? Yes. God can never act against His own character. God will never sin. If it's a sin, God won't do it. It's that interesting conundrum of can God make a rock that's so big that even God can't pick it up? Yes, because it's against His character. He would never create something that is more powerful than Him. He is the most powerful. The only thing God can't do is act against His own character. So when we say that God is almighty, this includes His eternality. He has no beginning. He has no end. We think of things that start and end. God exists outside of time and space, meaning He is infinite. God is also omnipresent. He is in all places at all times. He's omniscient. He knows all things. Therefore, He is omnipotent and all-powerful. Almighty God is the ruler of creation. Almighty God is above all laws of nature. Almighty God stands before no court and answers to absolutely no one. So we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. As Christians, we believe that when it comes to the competing stories of creation, there are none. It was God who created we do not believe that another God or some chaotic, impersonal force is the real Creator. Scripture teaches us in Colossians 1.16 that by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. Christians believe that God is the Creator. Though we cannot prove it beyond all doubt, to those who disbelieve any more than they can prove their account to us. As Christians, we may differ amongst ourselves as to how God worked out all of creation. Nevertheless, all Christians agree on this. God is creator of heaven and earth. At all times and in all places, Christians have agreed that whatever it means to have taken place, it was God who did it. So this morning, church family, knowing God as Father Almighty should do for us two things. First, it should draw us deeper into relationship with God, our Father. Second, it should draw us closer to each other as the church, for we are a family made of brothers and sisters in faith. So as a family, today, may we go forth living as one. Let's pray. God, our Father Almighty,
maker of heaven and earth. Help us to place our whole hope and life within your hands, for you are good and you are worthy. You have created us. You sustain us. You guide us and protect us. So help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.